Well, good morning. Uh, the name of the Lord is to be praised from the rising of the sun until its setting, even if it's an hour early. <laughs> Welcome to our Daylight Saving Time, Lord Day, Lord's Day uh, worship service. We're glad you have joined us, uh, and we intend to give God honor and praise uh, through the word and through musical expressions of our worship. I would like to also let you know, if you've not seen it already on our website, we're planning a Good Friday uh, service, uh, April the 2nd, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, it will be virtual. Uh, we will have people here in the sanctuary to actually lead and conduct the service, but what you may do is come to the church at the times uh, prescribed. You can see that on our website, and you can pick up uh, the elements for the Lord's table uh, for yourself and for family members. They'll be available at the time that we designate it and so we encourage you to participate I believe it'd be a blessing to us as we recall the Lord's sacrifice on Good Friday and worship him together if you need more information about it just look at our website and you will find it there the designated times are there as well so we encourage you to participate pray about it, and allow the Lord to bless you and us as we remember him as he has commanded us to but for now uh, we're going to worship the Lord together uh, we're going to open with a song, and so join us as we praise God together this morning. This morning, we're going to sing together, How Great is Our God. Brother George will lead us. How great is our God? How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? And all will see how great, how great is our God. Let's sing that again. Hey! 
reach, he stands. And time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one. Father, Spirit, and Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all Sing with me, how great is our God? How great is our God? Sing with me, how great is our God? And all will see how great, how great is our God. Now we're going to say name above all names. Thank God for the expression of music, a wonderful vehicle for expressing the greatness of our God. And he indeed is greater than we can even imagine. It'll take all eternity to uh, tell his greatness. And we'll be there to observe uh, his goodness and grace and mercy and praise him for the same forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, our scripture reading this morning is Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7, beginning at verse 18. These are familiar words to believers. They're wonderful words of comfort, uh, and it reveals, they reveal to us uh, the character of our God in part. Micah 7, verse 18. Micah's name, by the way, means Yahweh, who is like Yahweh. Verse 18. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity? and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession. He does not retain his anger forever, because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. 
Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob, an unchanging love to Abraham, which you swore to our forefathers from the days of old. The rhetorical question, who is like our God? I don't have to answer. It's a rhetorical question. We know. Let us go to him in prayer. We thank you, our God, for the revelation of yourself in your word from Genesis to Revelation. We thank you for its power uh, to enable us to lift our voices together in praise and thanksgiving and adoration. For you are unique. There is no one like you, can't be anyone like you, for you alone are God. And we bless you, our Father, for, and Son, and Holy Spirit, in fact, for all that you have done for us and with respect to our sins. We thank you that uh, you've treated our iniquities as an enemy, for you have tread them under your foot. We thank you for this graphic picture of how you've subdued uh, our enemy of sin, which had separated us from you, but now we are yours, and we are grateful to you for that. We thank you as well, Father, for the fact that you've forgotten our sins. You've cast them into the depths of the sea, and there is no one allowed to retrieve them, for they've been cast away from you forever. And for that, we thank you, and all of it's in the person of Christ, Jesus Christ, who paid the penalty ultimately for our sin, our transgression, our iniquities. And we are now assembled, whether in this room or virtually, to praise you. For we live in the light of the forgiveness of sin. We have the joy and, the re and we rejoice in it. And so now we can praise you, Lord, for the salvation you've bequeathed to us. We now uh, ask you, we entreat you to take charge of our time together and use it to magnify your own name, to minister to your people, not only in the song but in the word of God that will be open in a little while. We pray that you illumine our minds that we may grasp the scripture and its meaning. May it meet the needs of everyone who hears. May we delight in Jesus Christ in a fresh way for who he is and what he's accomplished. So give us listening ears, Father. Help us to receive what you have for us today. Feed your flock. Strengthen your flock. Shepherd us. Guide us. Uh, do the things that we need that alone you know. And we ask that you do these things for your own glory and for the good and joy of your people. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Living in this temple, dealing with this clay, I've been Never live outside the 
center of your will. Oh, keep me in the center of your will. Oh, keep me in the center of your will. Oh, the center. May I just say that in the center of God's will is the best place to be at all times, anywhere you are. You're in the best possible place. If you'll open your copy of the scripture to Luke chapter 5, it's where we take the message for this morning from Luke chapter 5. We'll begin at verse 17. Luke 5, beginning at verse 17. I will read the verses in your hearing, I want to set them there in your mind so that when we begin the exposition, you know uh, what's being addressed specifically. Verse 17, let me begin the reading. One day he was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and set him down in front of him. But not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier, to say, Your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, Get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. Immediately he got up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. They were all struck with astonishment, began glorifying God, and they were filled with fear, saying, we have seen remarkable things today. The subject for these verses, I've chosen these words, faith and forgiveness. 
What do men need most? They need the forgiveness of their sins. Nothing supersedes this pressing need for men. For men, that is, who in their fallen spiritual condition, apart from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, are alienated from holy God. They are separated from him. And this alienation is the greatest affliction of the human race. Nothing is comparable to this alienation. This affliction, this is why, has eternal consequences. To die unforgiven means eternal damnation. That's why people need forgiveness. For to die without forgiveness, to die with one's sins, is to experience eternal alienation from God. So forgiveness, then, is the greatest need that man has. But there's a gift. (laughs) It's the gift of salvation. And the gift of salvation is the greatest gift of God to men. The gift that he provides through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have the greatest need met by the greatest gift from God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the incident recorded in our text, Jesus addresses a man's spiritual condition and provides him with this greatest gift. With the exception of his paralysis, we can see ourselves in the text. This man is us. We were in the same situation before, if you're a Christian, before you came to Christ, you were in precisely the same condition that this man was about whom Luke writes. We also see here faith, faith role in this man receiving this great gift of forgiveness and salvation. In verse 17, we see the setting that Luke provides for us. It's in a house in Capernaum, Jesus' is headquarters for ministry during his earthly ministry. Here we see that he is one of the days. It says one day, just one of the days, where Jesus was relentlessly teaching the word of God day in and day out. What's fascinating about this is the word flesh is teaching the word of God. But also present there were the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, also known as the scribes, verse 21 tells us this. These scribes, they were professional theologians who were experts in the law, uh, its interpretation and application. Now, they weren't there to be edified. They didn't show up because, well, we want to hear this marvelous teacher. No, they were there to investigate. This, This new teacher, this one who was not schooled in the rabbinical training center. This Jesus of Nazareth. But also present that day, Luke tells us in verse 17, is this, the power of the Lord to heal. Fascinating statement. It probably means this. During his incarnation, Jesus became a bondservant, according to Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. And as a bondservant, what that means is he set aside the independent use of his divine powers. He lived in submission to God the Father, and he ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. Another thing we can see here in this verse, when Luke at the bottom of it says, uh, the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing, is that it was the will of God being signaled that he was going to heal that day. Now, in verse 18, According to Mark 2, 3, there were four men transporting the paralyzed man. This man was paralyzed, meaning loss of motion, obviously, uh, generally caused by the inability of muscles to function due to the injury in the motor area of the brain or spinal cord injury. Perhaps that's why. We don't know. Maybe it's a birth defect. We really don't know how this came about. The text doesn't tell us. But one thing we do know, and we can say for certainty, that there is no human cure. Only a miraculous intervention by the Lord himself could deliver this paralyzed man from his malady. Now he had four friends. The four friends and the lame man himself 
these five men believed that Jesus could help his paralysis, in fact, deliver him from his paralysis. Now, you need to understand uh, how, how they could have known this. It wasn't mystical. It wasn't, we're just going to take a leap in the dark. It wasn't anything like this, that biblical faith is based on knowledge, data, and evidence. I hope you get that. Biblical faith is based on knowledge, data, and evidence. These five men had knowledge of who Jesus is and what he was able to do. Jesus' many mighty miracles were not done in secret. The knowledge of him spread throughout the land. People had heard about this young, wise teacher who could heal. So they, they knew about this. Perhaps even they had seen evidence of it in those who had been healed by the power of the word, the touch of Christ. It didn't take much to go from seeing that and seeing, oh, our friend can be healed by this one who is mighty and there does not seem at all to be anything that he cannot heal. So they had seen what God had done for others and their faith had developed and grown. And they said to their friend and their friend concurred, obviously said, take me to him and let him heal me. These men acted on the reality of the demonstrated faith of Jesus Christ, the, the power of Christ to heal. That's why they were trying to bring him to him. They were motivated by faith. You see it there in the bottom of verse 18. They were trying to bring him in and set him down in front of Jesus. Verse 19, the first part of it, but not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd. Let's stop there at the comma. Mark chapter 2, verse 2, tells us that the room was packed. I can imagine Jesus' fame was spread for, uh, far and wide, and he didn't teach like the scribes and the Pharisees. He, he taught with authority, and so people gathered. They thronged to hear the Lord Jesus speak. And so in this house, some speculate it was Peter's house there in Capernaum. And so the place was packed. And there was no room, not even near the door, Mark tells us. They couldn't get in the crowd. Think about it. Here, here, here these four men carrying their friend on a stretcher, and they want to get in, and the crowd was, uh, for whatever reason, they wouldn't part. They wouldn't give way to let him in. That says something about them, doesn't it? So they couldn't gain entry. But these men who were exercising faith, first of all, they brought him there. And they wanted to get him to Jesus. They would not be denied. Their faith was persistent. They didn't say, oh, well, the obstacle's too great. It's too difficult. We can't get to him through the door. Uh, so I guess we'll have to abort this attempt to get our friend to the one we know who can heal him. And that's not what they did, obviously. You notice in verse 19, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher. Now, let me explain. Homes in Israel had flat roofs. And outside the house was a stairway that gave access to the top of the flat roof. That's what they did. They just left the front door, walked around, said, we'll get up there that way. Now, let me tell you something about the roof. The roof was, I mentioned just a moment ago, was usually flat. Wooden beams were laid across the top of the stone on mud wall walls with a layer of reeds, thorns, and several inches of clay on top of them. That was the roof. And so what they did, they opened a hole in the roof, and they took the man who was in this stretcher with, the, with, four, with ropes, the four of them, they manipulated the ropes to lure him down through that hole and gently lured him down in front of Jesus. Can you imagine as people sat there and they began to fall to debris and they look up and they see this guy's coming down and they're sitting right in front of Jesus? That must have been a sight. That, that happened. And Jesus saw this. Verse 20. Seeing their faith. Neither their four friends 
nor the lame man verbally communicates with Jesus. The text doesn't indicate they, that they said, Jesus, heal him. But visually, they spoke loudly and clearly, didn't they? Their faith in Jesus was quite manifest. It was without reservation. It was as if they had said, Jesus, we know you can heal him, and we ask you to do it. They saw their faith. Their faith was demonstrated. Their faith was displayed. The next point, faith granted. It's surprising, no doubt, to everyone in the room when Jesus uttered these words. Everybody's expecting a healing right at the moment. Jesus says in verse 20, friend, your sins are forgiven you. Why would Jesus do that? I'm going to tell you why. Because I opened the sermon saying the greatest need that man has is the forgiveness of sin. Certainly Jesus knew the deeper issue was not his physical well-being, but his spiritual well-being. Further, I don't doubt that the Lord Jesus knew the man's heart. He knew his heart was penitent. He knew he had sinned, and he knew that he needed forgiveness. Further, Jesus being who Jesus is... He does not see as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7. And Jesus, therefore, prioritized the man's soul. What has the higher rank? A healed body, get this, is temporary. All who are ever healed will eventually die. A healed soul is permanent. It's eternal healing. Jesus uttering these words, your sins are forgiven you. That word forgiven in the original is perfect tense verb, and it means a completed state. The abiding presence of forgiveness extended to the lame man. At that very moment, at that very instant when Jesus uttered those words to that lame man lying there in front of him, the guilt of his sin and his eternal penalty was removed by Christ. At that very moment, his trajectory spiritually changed. Prior to that, he was perishing, 1 Corinthians 1.18. At that very instant, he was no longer perishing, but his trajectory changed from going to eternal damnation to eternal bliss. Salvation. That's what was Zacharias was talking about in his prophecy earlier in Luke's gospel here. Luke chapter 1, verses 77 through 79, he, he, the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of sins. Salvation includes the forgiveness of sins. Our sins are forgiven. There's no accountability for them in terms of eternal punishment when they have been removed from us as far as the east is from the west. Forgiveness that Jesus provided for this man. It's the provision of the new covenant. Remember in the Old Testament, God promised it. The new covenant would come. He, he promised it in uh, Jeremiah promised it in Ezekiel. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12 says this, For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. That's a component of the new covenant. In addition to the new heart and the spirit, uh, God calls him in to walk after the law. God will forgive the sins, and he will remember them no more. Now, do understand, God... Uh, doesn't experience amnesia. He is not saying, I can't recall, because after all, he is omniscient. What this means, when God says, I will remember their sins no more, is this, I will not deal with them according to those sins, because I've forgiven them, there is no punishment forever. It is as if God has forgotten what we had done. Now, you need further to understand something here. In forgiving sin, God God does not compromise his righteousness and justice. 
God is just. God is righteous. He doesn't forgive people their sin, uh, as it were, um, giving them a uh, get-out-of-jail-free card. He doesn't sweep sin under the proverbial rug. He does and he won't. He is just and deals justly with sin. So God's forgiveness then is not at the expense of his righteousness and justice. He punishes sin. He justly deals with sin. He does not allow it to be unpaid for. Romans chapter 3, expositing the glories of the gospel, the apostle Paul fills in uh, understanding of this reality. As he is talking about justification by faith alone, Paul pins these words in Romans 3.25, whom God displayed, speaking of Christ, publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, God's righteousness, because in the forget forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed. He withheld judgment for a time is what that means. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, God in punishing Christ, Christ paying for our sins, Christ being the propitiation for our sin, Christ satisfying God's holy justice is the demonstration of God's righteousness. So that he, speaking of God, would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So God can justly grant us justification, and that includes forgiveness, and yet remain just because he has dealt with our sin. You see, if he hadn't dealt with our sin, then to forgive us would be unjust because sin hadn't been addressed. But God is righteous, and the substitute was propitiation, the one who satisfied our sin, God's justice, so he could forgive us our sin. That's the reality. That's the point of the death of Jesus Christ. Um, one of the points, <laughs> the forgiveness of sin. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28 uh, elucidates this theme further. Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And in doing so, he uh, institutes the, the new covenant. And he says in verse 28 of Matthew 26, speaking symbolically, of the reality that's going to take place the next day. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. The, the connection there is unmistakable, obviously. Jesus' death was for the forgiveness of sins of many. You know, and every time you take the Lord's table, you have to remember that. Uh, that, that the cup that represents his blood was symbi sim is symbolizing the fact that Christ shed his blood. He gave his life to forgive us our sins. By the way, that says a lot about the character of our sin, doesn't it? It took the death of the Son of God in human flesh to deal with our sin. Nothing less than the Son of God coming here, dying in our place, was able to take care of our rebellion against God. We take sin lightly. God does not. Men want to ignore it. They want to call it a mistake. They want to say, oh, it's a peccadillo. No, it's sin against holy God, and God had to deal with it with none, no one less than his own son. Now, I'm going to tell you, as believers... We're commissioned to proclaim the truth of this forgiveness. 
Jesus before his ascension back to heaven. In Luke chapter 24, verse 47 says this, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. By the way, there is no forgiveness without repentance. There is no forgiveness without Jesus Christ proclaimed in his name. Peter. Peter was uh, preaching some Gentiles. And he said this in Acts chapter 10, verse 43. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Get the biblical connection. No one will ever be forgiven of their sins apart from faith in Jesus Christ. No one. There can't be forgiveness of sin, uh, the, the rebellion against God, the iniquities and transgressions apart from faith in his son. It's the only way God get, grants it. So this man is forgiven by Jesus Christ, who, by the way, I'll re reiterate it, would bear this man's sin in his own body on the tree. What Jesus forgave, he says, I'll pay. Now, we need to ask a question and try to answer it. Jesus says the man's sins are forgiven, but the man was sick. We don't, do not know if his condition uh, indicates a one-to-one -one correspondence between his sin and his paralysis. The text doesn't tell us. We don't know if he's in that condition because he had sinned and God punished him with paralysis. The Bible is not, it doesn't state that. The man's paralysis could have been the result of living in a fallen created order. And that's very likely because, the, think about it, this world is disordered because of sin, and sin affects our bodies, and therefore there are def defects, birth, and uh, those after birth, and all the things that go on in life. Because we live in a disordered created order because of our sin. This illness also could have been a way to show the works of God being displayed in him. John chapter 9. Remember, the disciples thought and Jews thought, well, whenever there's sin, um, it's because you did something. Or your parents did something. Everything is retributive justice based. It's like that first point I made about him, one-to-one -one correspondence. Remember Job's so-called comforters? <laughs> you know, that's ironical. <laughs> And they, Job, you've done something. That's why you're in the mess you're in. God at the end of the book said, you guys didn't say what was right about me. They were talking nonsense. Job's circumstance had nothing to do with retributive justice. God wasn't punishing him for some sin. God had even said he's a just man, blameless, and all the rest. So we don't know why this man was in this condition. But I know one thing. Uh, the Pharisees, they had a pr problem with what Jesus said. Verse 21. The Pharisees, scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? And the word reason there is a word in the original from, from which we get our word dialogue. They were dialoguing in their own minds. They were going back and forth in their own minds about, wait, 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 wait. This guy claims to forgive sin. Who does he think he is? This is blasphemy. They protested that Jesus has taken, by saying blasphemies, uh, to himself the role and right that belongs solely to God. Well, the forgive sin does belong to God solely. He's the only one who has the right to do that. It's his prerogative. It's not a man's prerogative. 
Why is that? Because sin is against God and his law. He alone has the right to forgive those who violate his law. Well, they were, these theologians, they were right in that regard because we sin against God's law. He, he pronounced his law, did he not? The Ten Commandments and all the exposition of it in the Old Testament, all the law when God says do this or don't do this, we violate it. We violate his law. We've sinned against him. We've offended him. Now this charge of blasphemy against Jesus is, was their proclamation that he's a mere man. He is not God. And on this point, they were wrong. Profoundly wrong, eternally wrong. In his book, Worldviews in Conflict, Ronald Nash says this. When Jesus forgave people, he went beyond what any of us are able to do. Any of us can forgive people for things they do to us. Jesus did that, of course, but he also forgave people for sins they had committed against other people. In all these cases, Jesus acted as though the sins against other human beings were violations of his law and sins against him as well. Ronald Nash is right. In his book, Nash goes on to quote the great uh, English Don C.S. Lewis. All of us are aware of him. C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, Mere Christianity, these words. Now, unless the speaker is God, the claim to forgive sins is really so preposterous as to be comic. Who can all we can all understand how a man forgives offenses against himself, you tread on my toe, and I forgive you. You steal my money, and I forgive you. But what should we make of a man, himself unrobbed and untrodden on, who announced that he forgave you for trotting on other men's toes and stealing other men's money? Asinine fatuity is the kindest description we should give of his conduct. Yet this is what Jesus did. He told people that their sins were forgiven and never waited to consult all the other people whom their sins had undoubtedly injured. He unhesitatingly behaved as if he was the party chiefly concerned, the person chiefly offended in all offenses. This makes sense only if he really was God whose laws are broken and whose love is wounded in every sin. In the mouth of any speaker who is not God, these words would imply what I can only regard as a silliness and conceit unrivaled by any other character in history. End of quote. I agree with Lewis. Anybody else talks like that? They're foolish. That is blasphemy. But Jesus, being God in human flesh, could pronounce a man's sins forgiven because it was his law that that man broke. Jesus was aware of their reasoning, verse 22. And <laughs> what's interesting, he says, why are you reasoning in your hearts? For me, this would be unnerving. I'm sitting there, I'm thinking all oh, this going on in my heart, and then he turns and looks at me and says, uh, why are you thinking like that? And it exposes my thoughts. Uh, that would begin to make me the begin, I think, I hope, I doubt if I were like them, I'd have been just like them. I'd want to retreat from my theological ideas that I held. I said, something's different here. But Jesus knows what's in man, John 2.25. People cannot conceal from the Lord their inner cogitations. He knows, for example, when someone truly believes from the heart that God has raised him from the dead. Romans 10, 9. Someone says, if they believe in Jesus, God knows if they really do believe in him, that God has raised him from the dead. Because he knows what's really going on in the heart. Verse 23. 
And it says here, which is easier to say, Jesus says to them, your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk. From the perspective of the observer, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. No, of course, it's easy to say. Anybody can say that. Because after all, how can you prove uh, that his sins have been forgiven? So Jesus is going to tell them, or show them. Remember in school it was show and tell. You showed and then you told what you showed them. Jesus does the reverse. He told them, then he showed them. He told them, man, sins are forgiven. I'm going to show you how you can know they were. First, he, he calls himself the son of man who has authority on earth to forgive sins. Son of man, in its humiliation, he came to seek and to save that which is lost. He says, I have authority, the right and power. I have the divine prerogative to forgive sins on earth. I'm going to show you guys that my words weren't empty. That there is real authority. And as he says this, you notice the sentence is broken. The structure of it, there's a dash. He leaves off talking to them. It's almost as if it's, okay, it's time to show you guys. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher, and go home. The miracle would be a divine attestation of Jesus' claim to forgive sins. You want to know that I have the authority to forgive sins? I'm going to show you how I have the authority to do it. You're going to find the proof right now. And when Jesus gave the man the command, the command came with the power to comply. The command came with the power to comply. Remember that he did that later with Lazarus? Lazarus is dead. You can't give a dead man a command unless you give him the power to obey the command. And so when he said Lazarus come forth, he gave the dead Lazarus the power to come forth because he gave him life. At that very moment, at the moment Jesus said to this man, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher and go home. Jesus healed the man. His powerful word. And that shouldn't surprise us. After all, Genesis 1.1. And we know from further biblical revelation, guess who was there? Spoke all this into existence. Jesus Christ. And the man supplied with power. The forgiven man immediately obeyed him. He demonstrated his trust. He got up, picked up his bed. Now, this is instantaneous healing. Think about it. This man had been paralyzed. His muscles had atrophy. He didn't have to have occupational therapy or go to physical therapy. He just got up and walked as if he'd been doing it all along. It's the power of Jesus' miracle. It's amazing. He glorified God. Praise God. First, he's forgiven his sin. The burden of his sin is gone. And now he can walk. And he went home. He was carried from home to Jesus. And no doubt some of his neighbors saw him being carried by his friends. But then they see him coming back, carrying the thing he had been carried in. And I, I could imagine they said, what happened to you? He said, Jesus, he forgave my sin. He commanded me to get up, take up my stretcher, and go home. Now, that's a real miracle, people. That's a real healing. And it proved that Jesus has the power to forgive sins. So when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, you believe on me, your sins are forgiven. We know they are, number one, because of his word. He cannot lie. Number two, he demonstrated here, and we can apply it to ourselves. 
Now, the onlookers, can you imagine? They're all there in that packed house. They're all struck with astonishment, began glorifying God, and they were all filled with fear. The fear here is not fear of, oh my goodness, something bad's going to happen. No, the fear here is an understanding of God's holiness, His power, and His presence. It's a healthy fear. It produced reverence for God. They saw His power, they saw His holiness, saw all of that there. And they saw remarkable things there at the bottom of verse 26. Remarkable things. In fact, the word translated remarkable things that they had not expected. When they got there to hear Jesus teach, they didn't expect that that would transpire. I'll tell you what's fascinating here. Another thing that's fascinating. After witnessing a profound, powerful miracle like that and hearing our Lord's words and then proving that he is a forgiver of sins, we would think a revival should have ensued. No such thing is recorded. People did not seek out forgiveness for their sins and light a miraculous display in that room. They saw divine love and power clearly on display. You would think they'd say, hey, Jesus, would you forgive my sins? Some probably concluded that he was just a mere man whom God chose to use. Men have a remarkable way to rationalize things to escape personal accountability and commitment. Despite this and other miracles we find in the Gospel of John, John chapter 12, verse 37, Jesus did all kinds of miracles, all kinds of miracles. They were displayed before people, and you know what they did? They kept on not believing. They were not believing in Jesus. The God of this age had blinded their eyes. And they joined with him in their culpability of not believing. You know, it is a profound blessing that as Christians, God opened our eyes. Shown the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ in our hearts, and we have believed. That's grace. That's grace. Sovereign grace. It's demonstrated in this man's life. Forgiven and saved. Heaven bound. And I don't doubt when we're in heaven together with him one day, we'll recall this incident, and we'll know his name then. And we'll praise God together for what the Lord Jesus did as we're in the presence of our Redeemer with him. Let's take a moment to pray. Our Father, we thank you for uh, the provision of the forgiveness of sin, for we are needy in that regard. May uh, the truth of uh, forgiveness in Christ alone may be deeply ingrained in our hearts and printed upon our minds and that we might um, live in the light of it with a deeper understanding and rejoice in it and declare it to others who need it as we give the gospel, as we share it, that we'll tell men what they need to do to obtain this forgiveness that comes from you through your son. And we thank you for this time together in your word and the strengthening of our hearts and a praise to your name. And we pray these things now in the name of Christ. Amen. You're listening to me. You're not a Christian. You can appeal to him to have mercy on you, to forgive you of your sins. God hears the prayers of a penitent soul who will say, Lord, I've sinned against you. I know I'm a sinner. I need the salvation that comes from Jesus Christ who died on the cross for sinners and was buried and raised the third day. I want his salvation. Save me from my sins. If that's a heart cry of yours, you really believe that, you want Christ, he'll save you this very moment. We invite you to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll be here, God willing, again next week. Join us as we share together again in the word of God. Thank you.